we will actually be covering a Heidelberg Heidelberg Catechism question and answer one, and looking at Philippians chapter one, verse 18b to 30, if you'd like to take out your, uh, t- your scripture text, and also open to the Heidelberg Catechism, which is found on page 201 of the Forms and Prayers book before you. I'll be reading first from the uh, the scriptures from Philippians chapter 1, and then we will, uh, I will read the question and we will respond together subsequent to that with the Heidelberg Catechism question and answer. So this is uh, God's holy and inspired word from Philippians chapter 1, 18b to 30. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out. For my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of you. That you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now here I still have. This is the written word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, how good it is that uh, you give us an unshakable comfort uh, and a comfort that transcends the bounds of life and of death and the suffering that we presently experience. Father, I don't know the present circumstances of everyone in this room, but you know each and one of our hearts intimately. So may your word find its mark on the hearts of your people and may it comfort us and bind us up where where we are broken and encourage us to walk more faithfully as witnesses to your kingdom. Father, we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll now turn to the Heidelberg Catechism question and answer one. Uh, Again, I will ask the question, we'll respond together. Dear Church, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Well, several years ago, probably when I was still in high school, uh, I was sitting in church one Sunday morning and the pastor reported to us that an elderly man in the congregation had passed away. And this is a memory that's very vivid in my mind. Uh, And he went on to tell us uh, how he passed. He passed an old man, old age, uh, in a hospital bed uh, without pain. Uh, And he also reported to us his final words. As this this man felt death encroaching, uh, he looked to those in the room and he said, My only comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own, but I belong in body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And he went on to recite the rest of this catechism, which we just confessed together. It's a beautiful story. 
Now, there's a common saying with the purpose and the duty of the pastor, and I, I know that I'm not the pa a pastor yet, but nonetheless, the, I think the goal is still the same. The pastor's duty or hope is to teach his congregation how to die well, they say. Now, I'm young, very early on in this endeavor, but I've heard that a number of times already, and I think it's very important. So my question for you for a moment this morning to think on is, are you afraid to die? I think it's a question I think often about, especially in our times. I wonder often what might be some of the underlying reasons that a Christian is afraid to die. And that answer I usually come up with always relates to assurance of salvation. I think, you know, surely if you're a Christian, the reason that you're afraid to die is because you're not certain that you truly are a Christian who is actually a recipient of the grace of God. You know, perhaps there's other reasons I sometimes, you know, gander. Maybe it might be that they, they value treasures on earth. Somebody might value treasures on earth more than they value what they long for uh, in the new heaven and the new earth or in the union that comes with Christ in our passing. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to speculate about your hearts here. Those are just some of the reasons that I come up with. But in our day and age at least in the broadly evangelical church, I don't think that the fear of death should surprise us because numerous statistics show that there's in between a third to a fifth of American evangelicals believe that salvation comes by works. And so you might understand, we, we might wonder how anyone, when looking at the blood that's on their hands from a lifetime of sins, could find that they're actually good enough to earn the grace of God. And so I think, you know, on its own, this catechism teaches us is, is a polemic against that. And we don't find any sort of answer that gives any kind of works-based assurance of salvation, either in our text or in the catechism today. But rather, I think something very interesting is going on with Paul here in the text. You see, Paul in chains, near certain death, writing to a church suffering persecution, conveys a deep sense of abiding comfort that he has in his status with Christ. And we find that Paul conveys even that death is more desirable to him than life because it brings greater union with Christ. And he doesn't leave it here, but he then conveys the many reasons, the many things that actually ground the comfort that he experiences. And that really dominates his life such that he is disposed of joy even while talking about his desire to die and to go to be with Christ. That's very crazy in our culture that you might say, for me to live is Christ, I'm ready to die. I want to go and be with Christ, my Savior. And so I want to consider that today, kind of the, the Heidelberg Catechism in question, question and answer today through the lens of our passage in Philippians. We'll do that, uh, you know, I, through three broad points, comfort in death, comfort in life, and then finally, sources of comfort. So first, comfort in death. Now, there are a few words that are more familiar to, the, to any Christian, really, in all of church history than Paul's maxim in verse 21 here. Uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is to gain. For thousands of years now, for thousands of years as humanity has expanded, as we uh, discovered fire, as we discovered how to build uh, unshakable homes, as we took to the stars, we took to the skies, we charted oceans, we charted maps, people have been questioning uh, and pondering what the meaning of life is. So they might write books, they might gather around together in Socratic seminars for discussions, asking the question, what is the meaning of life? And Paul gets it in six words. Paul gets it in six words. For me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. This is a scary text, this is a scary verse to preach on, I'll tell you. I wonder if anything more can be said to expand on this statement here. To make it any more clear what that means. Can I, at, at 24, come up with anything more uh, profound to convey the gravity and the beautiful simplicity of what Paul wrote to the Philippian church? There is no purpose. There's no purpose so noble, no idea so liberating than the orientation of a heart which is in every way directed toward the king and his kingdom. That's what Paul expresses here. To live at all for Paul is Christ. That's it. That's life. In fact, a life not lived 
in Christ is not really a life lived at all as it was designed for us or as it ought to be. But here, in Philippians, Paul writing from jail, we have a man with eyes set so firmly on his Savior that he writes to a church that's suffering from persecution from his own chains, saying, for me to live is Christ. Mind you, he's about to go stand before Caesar. He doesn't know if he's going to be put to death. You recall the long passage in 1 Corinthians 11 where he documents all of his struggles and all of his sufferings. It's a long list. Physical beatings, shipwrecks, his anxiety for the church. And yet here we do not find a man who in answering the biggest question of life is lamenting his suffering, but rather he boldly states amidst his, amidst his dark and dire circumstances that life is Christ and death is gain. Now, I would, I would understand if some might think, well, Paul is just running from his pain in, headlong into death because it will deliver him from the pain that he presently experiences in his life. But I don't think that's what we find in the rest of the text. Rather, he articulates that he's actually hard-pressed between staying and between going to be with Christ. He says, going to be with Christ is far better, but staying is necessary for your sake. He does not desire to flee his chains by his death. That's not what's going on here. Death is not an escape from the chains that, that he is bound in, or from all the beatings and all the pain and all his sorrow that he endures on an everyday basis, from his dark, bleak cell or wherever they kept him. Death is actually for Paul the means through through which he is liberated to go and be in the presence of his Savior in a much greater way. That's what serves as the basis of Paul's longing. A deep, abiding desire to go and to be with Christ. As Paul felt the weight of his chains then, and he faced imminent execution, he was overwhelmed not by pain, but by the gain of suffering and death. A suffering and death which would actually bring him to Christ. Death is not something, <clears throat> speaking about comfort and answering today's question, death is not something which threatens the comfort that Paul experiences on an, on an everyday basis. And I think there's two reasons for this. First of all, because he sees death as something which leads, as we've already mentioned, to greater union with Christ. He does not fear his death. It will instead bring him to the place that he most desires to be, and Paul can think of no place better. Excuse me. <clears throat> but secondly, Paul does not threaten, or death does not threaten Paul because his whole life is Christ himself. And so long as he lives in Christ, the consequence doesn't matter to Paul. So long as he lives in Christ, death is okay for Paul. Nothing can threaten that comfort. I think from the fall of Adam, this is something that I, I was really fascinated by. From the fall of Adam, mankind has been seeking autonomy to direct his own ways, to order his own life, to be king in his own eyes, and to determine what's right for himself. He wants to be his own life. But Paul doesn't see life that way. He values the complete opposite of human autonomy. For Christ to define life is not to remove his freedom, but it frees him from a life of raging against the tender love and, and, and care of his sovereign Savior King. Therefore, Paul can say, my only comfort in life, my only comfort is that I get to live for Christ and in doing so, die for him. I am set free from the tyranny of sin. I'm not my own, and everything that I do, everything that I am, is Christ's. Death isn't something that terrifies me, Paul says, but the prospect of it brings me great comfort, for I know whom I have believed, and I know where I will go when I pass. The comfort that Paul experiences in life is not shaken by his death, but strengthened by his death. But be that as it may, we nonetheless 
in death are relieved from the sorrow that we experience in our bodies of sin and flesh. And so what about the comfort that we experience in life? Well, we find further evidence that Paul in the first place is not running from suffering into death for his comfort because he has no comfort in his life. But he is filled with comfort and filled with joy in his life as well. We find evidence of this in verse 18b to 20. Paul opens our passage expressing joy and confidence. Joy and confidence. Despite all the suffering that Paul has experienced, he sees his life as filled with goodness that leads him to unfathomable, unshakable joy. Yes, I will rejoice. Paul, sitting and rotting in a Roman prison, uncertain of the outcome of his trial, doesn't ask for his last steak meal with a baked potato and asparagus. He doesn't ask for his chains to be taken off so that he can just move his hands freely and kind of, kind of rub the bruises from the shackles. He doesn't ask for wine. He doesn't ask for water. He doesn't ask for his favorite stout. He's not sitting there lamenting and begging for all of the problems that plague everyday life for him to be removed from him. (laughs) None of Paul's comfort is tied or tethered around the things that normatively increase the anxiety, the discomfort, the disillusionment, the dissatisfaction of everyday human life for the most of us. But he writes to them saying, I know through your prayers and through the help of the Spirit that this will turn out for my deliverance. And then he goes on to qualify what deliverance looks like for him. It is his eager expectation and hope that he will not at all be put, be put to shame, but with full courage now as always, Christ would be honored in his body, whether by his life or by his death. In other words, the deliverance that Paul speaks of has very little to do with his exoneration in his trial and release from imprisonment. Paul speaking about deliverance does not inherently mean that he's going to be set free, that he's going to go back to Ephesus or Jerusalem and have a, a, you know, just a holly jolly time. That's not what he's speaking of here. Here we see that Paul is speaking about a deliverance with regard to the way that he honors Christ. <clears throat> Paul's life is so directed toward Christ, his comfort is so secure that his own personal health and well-being is peripheral to him. It doesn't matter to him. What weighs on his heart, what fills his thought, thoughts as he sits in prison is that Christ would be magnified in all that he does, even in his suffering. And conversely, what would bring him discomfort, what would bring him shame then, is his failure to do anything consistent with a faithful witness to Christ in his body, whether by life or by death. His comfort is never threatened by his shackles unless it costs the witness of Christ. The source of his discomfort would be his failure to honor him. I think that's significant. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being so concerned for Christ and for his gospel, so confident that everything in your life will work out for your good, that your concern shifts from your own bubble to the life of the gospel in you as others see it? And so Paul writes confidently, I know that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. And these these words are the same words that Job writes, that Job speaks, rather. In Job chapter 13, it's written, Though he slays me, though God should send affliction my way, yet I will hope in him, I will surely defend my ways to his face, for I know that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. In his letter, Paul identifies himself with a man who, in one short little chapter, has lost everything that he has. 
And yet, as we think back on Job's suffering, remember, we remember that Job's tests were to show him as a faithful servant of the Lord. There in that story, we read, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side, but stretch out your hand against him and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face? And the Lord said, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. There's this cosmic dialogue going on. And so the Lord allows Job to be tested. And we remember what the end of the chapter says. In all of this, Job did not sin or accuse God with wrong. And so we find that Job is a faithful witness who through his suffering vindicates God and bears a faithful witness to him against the accuser of all people. Moreover, as the ending of the chapter uh, tells us in, in Philippians chapter 1, Paul moves from his discussion about himself to his, his exhortation for them. He encourages them to let their own lives be worthy of the gospel and that they are to stand firm side by side together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in anything by their opponents whose presence and oppressive character serves as an indicator of their salvation. And he goes on, this oppression that you suffer has actually been granted to you for the sake of Christ. Paul here is exhorting them unto the same kind of faithful witness for the gospel against foes who oppress them that he's just spoken of in his own life. He consoles their hearts by stating firmly that part and parcel to the plans of God and the way that he has designed their life is that his people would suffer for his sake. And this language, by the way, of granting, it has been granted to you, is the same language that Scripture uses when it talks about grace. It is a grace for the children of God to suffer for Christ. And thus we can be confident that not a hair will fall from our head without the will of our Father in heaven. That this is a part of of the hairs that fall by the will of the Father, or rather a part of his perfect preserving grace. And so boldly and firmly, we can conclude, all things, even our suffering, which has been granted to us by the, for the sake of Christ, all things must work together for their salvation. So I wonder this morning, do we get any sense at all, in any way, shape, or form, from Paul's own example and his exhortation that the life of the believer and the comfort they experience in life should be undermined in any way by the situations and the locations that they find themselves in? I don't think the answer to that is affirmative. I don't think he gives us the sense that the things that happen to us in life should undermine the certain comfort and hope that we have in the place that we are all longing to be. Or the certain comfort and hope that we have in life, in what we suffer, because we know it comes to us as grace from the hand of the Father. Believers have an unshakable comfort in both life and in death. In life, they know that their suffering is ordained by God. And in death, they are not simply longing for an escape from pain, from depression, from anxiety, but for greater, more intimate union with the one who is life, with the one in whom we live and move and have our being. But that doesn't mean we should ask, from where does that comfort come? What are the sources of that comfort? <clears throat> well, for one, Paul indicates in the first place that it comes from the prayers of the saints and the help of the Spirit. It's not blind hope that arbitrarily possesses ignorantly, 
you know, ignorantly prancing through life as though nothing that happens matters to us because of our unshakable hope and comfort. I'm not today saying that you shouldn't experience discomfort or pain. I'm saying you have an unshakable hope and comfort. Rather, understanding the challenges of life in the first place, understanding the suffering that each and every person in this room and each and every congregation uh, brings every Sunday morning, we pray for one another. We sincerely and dearly pray for and with one another. Paul indicates here that one of the primary reasons why he is able to have hope and joy is because he knows that the, that the prayers of the saints are the ordained means through which God will sustain him. It's one of the ways that he can have comfort is knowing that others are praying for him. God will answer their prayers for they ask it in the name of Jesus. But more than just the prayers for the saints, it's also the Spirit of God who serves as the grounds for Paul's confidence. You see, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures him of eternal life and makes him wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him such that, as he's sitting there contemplating whether or not he will go or whether or not he will stay, he talks about having fruitful labor for the sake of Christ and his kingdom and the promulgation and furtherance of his gospel. He, the Spirit, is the one who enables him to have comfort. He is the one who also enables him to be thoroughly dedicated to bear a faithful witness. And so Paul's chains are not chains that break or shatter him. They are not the anvil where Paul's faith is shattered or broken. No, he views them as a symbol of his union with Christ his Savior, who himself came as the suffering servant and was bound as we heard earlier, so that he could burst the bonds of death. Therefore, in the same way that Paul speaks of his own suffering, we look at what he says to the church and his exhortation to them in verse 27 to 30. The suffering and the persecution that they endure at the hands of unbelievers is evidence to them. It's actually evidence to them of their right standing with God, of their salvation. The suffering and the persecution that they endure at the hands of unbelievers indicates to them that they are indeed children of God. And so people of God, because our comfort and our confidence is not rooted in ourselves, and for that reason and that reason alone, it is an unshakable comfort and it is an unshakable hope. And Paul indicates to us here something that's marvelous. Our sources of comfort actually compound. They're multiplying. In each and every case, he gives reason after reason after reason that sort of feeds on each other. We don't serve a God who wishes for us to suffer alone or to suffer in discomfort or to struggle on our own. We don't serve a God who wishes us to, to be anxious that we'll fail to be a faithful witness to him and to his kingdom. And by the way, when unbelievers meet somebody who has an unshakable comfort that can tell them straight to their faith, I am ready and willing to go and be with my Savior, what does that say to them? No, our God gives us ample reasons to have comfort, ample reasons, ample sources for our comfort. He gives us prayer for one another. He gives us his spirit to work in and dwell in our hearts. As the Heidelberg Catechism says, he gives us the blood of his son. As our text reminds us, he gives us the knowledge that, great, that he gracefully grants us to share in the suffering which Christ endured on the cross, filling up what was lacking in his suffering. And again, he gives us even the persecution of our enemies as another evidence to ground the comfort that we experience as, as we long for the day when we will be with Christ in glory, when we will be disembodied spirits waiting for his return, away from the brokenness of human flesh, longing for the restoration and glorification of all things. In every direction that we look, there is reason after reason that we should have great comfort and great peace in the saving work of God in Christ Jesus. We say grace upon grace. Today I say comfort upon comfort. 
We live in a dark time where there's a lot of fear going around. COVID, the reminder of our mortality, our inability to control the fidelity of our life. Maybe we lack faith in our president. Maybe we are unsettled by the political unrest in our country. Maybe we're unsettled by the international unrest going around the world, terrorism, or just the disagreements between how we live and conduct and order life. You won't ever look to creation and find lasting comfort and peace. You won't find it. But you can look to the one who drank the cup of God's wrath on the cross, who drank sorrowful so that you might have comfort. And with Paul Bunyan's pilgrim, Christian, you might express, he hath given me rest by his sorrow and life by his death. Thus far did I come laden with my sins, nor could aught ease the grief that I was in till I came hither. What a place is this? Must here be the beginning of my bliss. Must here the burden fall from my back. Must here the strings of my, that bound it, to my, bound it to me crack. Blessed cross, blessed sepulcher. Blessed rather be the man that there was put to shame for me. I pray today that you are just a little bit more ready to die because you do not lack comfort and that you, like me and like Paul, long in a much greater way than you value the flesh to go and to be with Christ in glory. I'd like to close with this. In my reading, I encountered a story of the Cambodian church from 1975. The writer, telling of a time in great tribulation for the church, reported the contents of a letter from a brother. <clears throat> my dear friends, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Please pray that this will be worked out in my life. Your brother in Christ, Tian Chikchurk. The report of this story then commented, it was his final prayer request. Will we watch and pray with him in, the, in, in this moment of agony? He had, underworded this, he had underscored the word die three times. The Lord answered his prayer. In life, he was one who lived single-mindedly for Christ. And in dying a martyr's death, making the ultimate sacrifice, he bore compelling witness to his Lord. And so it was not a waste, but a gain for the Cambodian church and for the beloved Chichur. Those tear, tears all wiped away, now joy in the immediate presence of the Lord. For us to live as Christ and to die as gain.